news of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech and it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, flying high on a farm. Semper Fi tattooed on his left arm. Welcome to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I am your host, the editor of politics and culture at worldtribune.com. Thank you for spending some time with us. I think this week you must have been as disgusted as I was at the president's behavior. You recall that last week we did a segment, it was the third segment of the show, where we uh, analyzed Barbara Walters' interview with the president and the first lady. And we saw there that the first lady rushed to the president's defense as she was clearly humiliating him. Well, what does the president do this week to thank his wife for standing by him when everybody else is deserting him? He humiliates her at the memorial of Nelson Mandela. He humiliates her by, by flirting with the um, leader, uh, the, the Danish prime minister, a very attractive blonde, leggy blonde. So, Michelle Obama, that's what you get for standing by your man. You get a public slap in the face. He took a picture of himself. He was gleeful. He was smiling with her. He couldn't help whispering. And they were, you know, sitting next to each other, looking a little too close for comfort, if you ask me. Well, let's just remind the president how the first lady uh, stood by his side just last week when everybody else was turning away from him. Roll it, Brittany. Do you think that the first lady might have made a better president than you? Of course. Oh. <laughs> of course. Uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's an easy question. Uh, but uh, she, she's smart enough to know that... Uh, uh, you know, she might not want uh, to, to go through the process. I absolutely don't agree. Uh, you know, he uh, has a level of patience and, and focus uh, and tenacity and calm, you know, that you know, you, that just doesn't, you know, come by. You don't have that patience. I, d- I definitely don't. So there was the first lady. Everybody is deserting her man. Uh, the Democrats are souring on him. The young are abandoning him. The Hispanics are abandoning him. He's dropping in the polls. The public thinks he's, he's untrustworthy. And she stands by her man. She rallies to her, his side. She says to Barbara Walters stuff like, you know, he's got the long view. He's this and he's that. And then when Barbara Walters asked the humiliating question about, you know, should she, should she have been, would she have been a better pri- uh, president? Uh, she says, no, he's patient. He's tenacious, et cetera, et cetera. She stood by her man through thick and thin. And what does the scoundrel do in front of 91 world leaders? That louse couldn't help himself but to flirt incessantly with the leggy blonde. I mean, it was clear he was living out some kind of fantasy. He must have had a fantasy when he was young. You know what? One day I'll be a political leader and I'll go to a rally and there'll be a beautiful blonde. And she won't just be beautiful. She'll also be another leader of another political country and will engage in an awesome flirtation. It was like he was living a frat boy fantasy. He completely lost himself. I mean, did he not realize that you had all the world watching at that time? I mean, did he completely lose his mind? And not only that, but his wife was sitting right next to him. And she was fuming. And I mean fuming. You've got to see those those photos. She was snarling at him. And he didn't even take a hint. He was so lost in this flirtation. He was so taken by the leggy blonde that he forgot himself completely. He forgot where he was. 
And, you know, he wasn't just anywhere. He was at the memorial of Nelson Mandela, a world historical figure. The president himself had just heaped all kinds of praise upon Mandela, emphasizing the grandiosity of the man. And what what does he do? He contrasts that grandiosity with this snake-in-the-grass behavior. I was looking for the right words. I didn't want to sound too unladylike. But that is just snake-in-the-grass behavior. Listen to what he said about uh, Nelson Mandela and contrast that with what I've just described. Roll it, Brittany. Madiba would emerge as the last great liberator of the 20th century. Like Gandhi, he would lead a resistance movement, a movement that at its start had little prospect for success. Like Dr. King, He would give potent voice to the claims of the oppressed and the moral necessity of racial justice. He would endure a brutal imprisonment that began in the time of Kennedy and Khrushchev and reached the final days of the Cold War. Emerging from prison without the force of arms, he would like Abraham Lincoln, hold his country together when it threatened to break apart. And there was the president. In the face of this man's death, who he is describing in the grandest of terms, comparing him to the great leaders of our time, the president of the United States lost his mind for the leggy blonde. That is what we saw this week. Now, What's even equally appalling is that the leggy blonde was part of the flirtation and she is married too. And she had no regard whatsoever for her own position, her country's position, or the fact that the man's wife was right there, just two seats away. Now, I've got to say something. Women no longer do something that they should do, which is once in a while you got to slap somebody in the face. If I were Michelle Obama, at that moment, with everyone watching, I would have gotten up and slapped him right in the face. Now, some of you are saying, oh, come on, Dr. Grace, that's ridiculous. You're, you, th- that would have been a huge, an even bigger spectacle. Do you know that women across the world would cheer that? Do something. React. Stand up for yourself. Demand self-respect. She looked at him with anger bursting from her eyes. And eventually, once you see the photos, she insinuates herself between him and her. And there's a couple more photos where the president realizes he's in the doghouse and then he tries to kiss Michelle Obama's hand. But by then, it's too late. By now, you've got the tabloids are going to jump all over this, the press, the international press. This becomes a big scandal. And this is just a stupid mistake. This is one of those really unforced errors. Here the president had an opportunity to make us forget what a bumbling idiot he is, and he goes abroad and behaves like a bumbling idiot, which offends women, and that's another part of his base. And Michelle Obama should demand respect from her man, especially in public, and especially after she stood up uh, for him and tried very hard to pull his chestnuts out of the fire. Now I have to make a larger point. What about as an African-American man? This is extremely important. What this president represents is, he has so far, even his worst critics haven't been able to deny this. He has acquitted himself as a responsible respectable African-American family man. When he was first elected, Juan Williams, a black commentator for Fox News, he basically cried on the air saying, do you know how remarkable it is to see a wholesome black family in full public view, a happy, wholesome black family? And the president has so far maintained that image fairly well as a family man, and that is sorely needed, especially where you have in the African-American community a very high incidence of family breakdown. And here the president and the first lady have stood brilliantly for something different. And even his worst critics will always concede, well, look, he's a good family man. 
But what do you do? At the moment when you're this low in the polls, you even shatter that image of yourself, which is sorely, sorely needed among African Americans, and you behave like a small snake in the grass, flirting in public view with a leggy, leggy blonde with your wife right beside you? So that was really disgraceful. And I'm really upset. I'm really upset for Michelle Obama, honestly. I'm, I'm upset. And you know what? As a political strategist, if I were a political strategist advising him, I think I literally would have thrown something across the room when I was talking to the president. I would say, your poll numbers are dropping like a stone. People don't trust you and they don't believe in you. You are now in a foreign nation discussing a world historical leader. And what do you do? You behave like a louse? And these are the headlines we've got to confront when we desperately need positive PR? So as a political strategist, I would be totally furious with him. But you know, even more than any of that, as American citizens, this is outrageous behavior. The President of the United States represents all of us when he is abroad. And when he is abroad in an event that is basically a world historical event, and it is an event that is serious, that requires a great dignity and composure, we want our presidents to behave in the appropriate manner. This is embarrassing to all of us. We elected him to acquit himself responsibly when he is abroad. You know, I couldn't help thinking of that other incident which made headlines when he and Sarkozy, uh, the previous French leader during Obama's first term, this made the news. They were caught on camera turning around, staring at the behind of a 16-year-old girl. And I can't even, you know what, isn't that funny? I can't even remember what conference they were at or what the results of that conference were. But I remember that the president and the French prime minister got caught on camera behaving like two frat boys. And you see, this is the kind of thing that sticks in people's minds. These images caught on camera stick in people's minds. And this makes a very poor impression. It's going to stick in the mind of all Americans. It's going to further alienate women who are also beginning to turn on this president. It's going to further outrage men and women who desire the president to be dignified abroad, men and women who value family values, men and women who have a sense of what the office of the United States is. So to the president of the United States, shame on you. You went abroad and instead of taking some of that glow that might have come from talking about the legacy of Nelson Mandela, you come like a back home, like a snake in the grass. You betrayed your wife. You betrayed your country. You betrayed Nelson Mandela. You betrayed the people of South Africa. You betrayed the Danish prime minister's husband. This was a disgusting spectacle that deserves sharp reprimand. And I hope that you get what you deserve, which is your poll numbers continue to drop because those poll numbers reflect a lack of confidence in you that you are clearly earning. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture for WorldTribune.com. And we're upholding values that will never die, and we're putting the president straight in the doghouse. And everybody having a ball. Hey, hey. Until the fellas start the name calling. And the girls respond to the call. Ha, ha, I have a pull one shot ha, out. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Well, 
Welcome to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, your host. And who gets the applause this year? Who is Time's Person of the Year? It is a shocking decision, a surprising decision. Time has named Pope Francis as the Person of the Year. And this is truly a remarkable occurrence. In the 91 years that Time magazine has done this, there are only two other popes who have been named Person of the Year. They are Pope John Paul and Pope John the Twenty-Third. And Pope Francis is also part of a very short list of uh, religious leaders who has, you know, not just Catholic leaders, but religious leaders who has become the Person of the Year. So Time magazine celebrating a Catholic pontiff. Now, who would have expected that? You know, when you really stop and think about it, there's a very good reason why Time Magazine chose this man to be the person of the year. And I think it has a little bit less to do with the Pope's merits than it has to do with trying to deflect attention from the real person who is the real person of the year. I think Time Magazine didn't want to actually name our number a number one person of the year as the person of the year because it would bring too much humiliation to the President of the United States. And I'll explain that in a moment. So I'm a little bit cynical regarding this choice. I don't think Time Magazine chose Pope Francis because suddenly they have found religion and are embracing the doctrine of the Catholic Church and truly are embracing this man. I think they chose him for all the wrong reasons. Well, the explanation that they gave is that the Pope has billions of followers that he's talked about on the Internet more than any other individual, and that in the very short time that he's become pontiff, he has really shaken up the image of the Church. And the word that is most often used is that he is a humble man. He has brought great humility back to a very, very powerful position. And I can't contest that. I agree. I think Pope Francis has done that very well. And this summer, when we broadcast an episode of American Heartland, I said, I said, this man is refreshing. I like the way that he speaks. I think he's very refreshing in a few things. Do you remember in Rio uh, during World Youth Day, he told the young to go out in the street and make a mess. He basically sent the message that you should preach anywhere and everywhere. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's inspiring. I like the way that he reaches out to the people and he's brought a very uh, glorious grand office. He's brought that much closer to the ordinary folk. He will even call people who write to, to him. He'll call them directly to have a chat. That's a good thing. That's a nice thing. He lives humbly. He lives with austerity. He doesn't relish in the materialism, the perks and privileges that his office comes with. That's a good thing. And I have to say, too, one of his trademarks is his remarkable humility. And the world loves and appreciates that. From the very moment that he was inaugurated, his humility came through. Roll it, Brittany. I thank the Lord that I can celebrate this Holy Mass for the inauguration of my Petrine ministry on the Solemnity of St. Joseph, the spouse of the Virgin Mary and the patron of the Universal Church. It is a significant coincidence, and it is also the name day of my venerable predecessor. We are close to him with our prayers, full of affection and gratitude. Well, as you can hear, the man speaks with gentle words and simple words, and he's tried to take us all closer to the gospel. He's tried to take us away from the great controversial battles that his two predecessors constantly engaged in. And for a brief moment, I was one of those people who said, this is a good thing. We need to immerse ourselves in the gospel. We need to immerse ourselves in the simple language of Jesus himself. And I also embrace the pontiff and agree with the pontiff in recalling us to our duty 
to help the sick and the poor and the weakest among us. He does all of this beautifully. But I don't think that that's why Time Magazine has, had, has named him Person of the Year. Time Magazine has named him Person of the Year because he has made headlines in three ways that they really like. When the pontiff was asked a question as to whether or not an individual who has homosexual inclination but doesn't practice that homosexual inclination should be allowed to join the priesthood, he said in an off-the-cuff statement, Who am I to judge them if they truly seek the Lord? Who am I to judge a gay person? Oh, the press loves that. They love that. Show compassion to the gay people and they'll put you on the cover of Time. Why else has Time magazine named him? He also spoke very warmly about atheists encouraging them to participate in good work. So he seemed to extend a very warm hand towards atheists. Oh, they love that. Time Magazine loves that. And the Pope has also addressed a society that is full of greed and materialism, is headed on the wrong track. He seems to be a a critic of the excesses of capitalism. So they love that. Those are the three reasons that they have put Pope Francis on the cover of their magazine. But more than any of these, the major reason they put Pope Francis on the cover was because they didn't want to put somebody else who truly deserves it on the cover. And I want to take a few moments now to give you my countdown of the five people of the year. Number five, and this is person of the year, you might want to say for all the wrong reasons, it's Miley Cyrus. Good girl gone bad, gone very, very, very bad. The Disney princess this year came out with a raunchy video, and then she followed it up with a raunchy performance at the VMAs. And it was a really deplorable performance, taking our culture to a whole new low. And we criticized it every step of the way. We who are standing on guard for cultural standards of decency. But she had an impact. And we've got to say, Miley Cyrus, she did it. She dropped our standards another notch. Number four. And again, this is a person of the year in reverse in terms of a negative impact. And that is Kathleen Sebelius, our, you know, uh, illustrious uh, secretary who headed up the disastrous, catastrophic rollout of Obamacare. This is a person, unless you were someone that follows politics like I do on a daily basis, most of you out there didn't even know her name. And now you know her name and you really dislike her because she truly does look like the Wicked Witch of the West. She is number four for colossal incompetence. Number three. I would put Pope Francis as number three. On my list, he's number three. Look, I'm a devoted, devout Catholic. There's a lot about this Pope that I like. There's a few things I'm really deeply concerned about. But I do like his great humility. I love the way he's returning us to the gospel. I love a lot of what he is doing. So I certainly say kudos to you. You do deserve great praise. Number three. That's where I would put Pope Francis this year. And like I said, I'm as devoted as they come in terms of being a Catholic. Who do I think deserves an even greater mention as person of the year? I think number two is none other than Russian leader Vladimir Putin. Because this man basically prevented us from heading, rushing into another war in the Middle East. He helped President Obama pull out of a disastrous, disastrous Syria policy. And I've also got to say another person of the year in reverse. The United States is in retreat, and he is flexing his muscle. He's stepping in 
where the United States is fading. He basically became the de facto leader of the Middle East. In essence, as, a, as America signals that we're not that interested in being the world's cop, he signaled, you know what, I am. And he did so by clearly backing a Syrian leader and by telling, calling out Americans many times on their, on their disastrous course of action. He won respect around the world. So he's got to be number two. But of course Time Magazine doesn't want to say that because to say that, you've got to be saying also that President Obama is doing a horrible job. That would only highlight that. Whereas Pope Francis doesn't highlight that. He just distracts attention from that. But we've got a number one person of the year. And can you roll the drum roll, Brittany? No question about it. The person of the year, the person of the decade, probably the person of the century is a mild-mannered contractor, whistleblower, Edward Snowden, who with great bravery and clarity put his life on the line to warn us all that we are being spied upon and our liberties are being threatened. Roll it, Brittany. Uh, when you're in positions of, of privileged access, like a, a systems administrator for these sort of intelligence community agencies, you're exposed to a lot more information on a broader scale than the average employee. And because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing, but uh, over the course of a normal person's career, you'd only see one or two of these instances. Uh, when you see everything, you see them on a more frequent basis. And you recognize that some of these things are actually abuses. And when you talk to people about them uh, in a place like this, where this is the, the normal state of business, people tend not to take them very seriously and you know, move on from them. But over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up and you feel compelled to talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the more you're ignored, the more you're told it's not a problem until eventually you realize that uh, these things need to be determined by the public, not by somebody who was simply hired by the government. Bingo! And that is the person of the year. Of course, Time Magazine couldn't put Edward Snowden on the cover because if you put Edward Snowden on the cover, you're sending a signal loud and clear that he is not a traitor, as the Obama administration has said, but that he is a hero and that the president of the United States is supervising an intrusive state. He's done nothing to curb the powers of the NSA. He's only expanded them. And this betrays one of the cardinal principles of the left, too. So there's no way they would have put Edward Snowden on the cover. That's why they went with Pope Francis. But Edward Snowden showed courage, bravery, tremendous self-sacrifice. This man turned his whole life upside down. He has been named a traitor and his life is in danger. Many people in the intelligence community want him dead. They have said, we want him, quote unquote, disappeared. And yet he has taken on an entire establishment, all in the service of the American people, crying out to protect our liberties. This man is brave. This is the person of the year of the decade and of the century. He is brave. And we're sending out this song to celebrate the man of our time, Edward Snowden. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Well, 
Welcome back to American Heartland. I'm your host, Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. And guess who can't stop taxing and spending? It's a party up there in Washington, D.C. on our dime. The Democrats and the Republicans have announced this week that they've got a new budget. And none other than Wisconsin Congressman, a Republican, Paul Ryan, a darling of the party, went out there before the press to tout the glories of the deal. And he's trying to sell this deal as the best that he could possibly get, and one that is good for the country, and one that is actually, over the long run, going to cut spending and not raise our taxes. Now, you know when a Democrat signs on to a bill that all those things are not likely to happen. This budget deal undoes one of the great victories that Republicans have had. They imposed across the board automatic cuts known as the sequester. And that sequester was supposed to remain in place. And what does Paul Ryan do? He reverses that. He removes the caps on spending in this budget. So that for the next two years, spending goes up, not down. And then in 2016, so the logic goes, some of the reduction in spending kicks in. Now, you're trying to tell us that with a straight face? You told us before that the sequester was intended to remain in place to ensure that we stuck to our parameters, and now you're reversing that. So what guarantee do we have, even by your very own logic, that in two years, once you get your spending increase, you're not going to reverse the promised cuts? This game is sick, it's transparent, and it's got to stop. Now, you'll remember, folks, that this summer, I said I'm done with the Republican Party. And I also predicted I was ahead of my time, and a lot of you are going to follow suit. You know what the Republican Party is like? It's like that crummy boyfriend that your best friend is dating, and you keep calling her on the phone every night, And she's crying, saying, he just mistreated me again. And you tell her, I don't know how to break this to you, but you've got to end the relationship. And she says, yeah, I think you're right. And then the next day you call her and they're together again. And this goes on and on and on. And after a while, when she calls you, you don't want to talk about it anymore. Because you can see clearly when someone keeps betraying you, unless you take action, that betrayal won't stop. And this is what we see with the Republican Party. We just had the sequester, and now the sequester is gone. And listen to what Paul Ryan is trying to tell us about how this deal is good for the country. Roll it, Brittany. This bill reduces the deficit by $23 billion, and it does not raise taxes, and it cuts spending in a smarter way. From the outset, we knew that if we forced each other to compromise a core principle, we would get nowhere. That is why we decided to focus on where the common ground is. So that's what we've done. That means to me a budget agreement that reduces the deficit without raising taxes and replaces some of the arbitrary across-the-board spending cuts with smarter permanent reforms that pay for this relief. And the truth of the matter is it does none of the above. It doesn't reduce the deficit, not anytime soon. We're supposed to expect that it will in the future, but it doesn't do that now. And he says it doesn't raise our taxes. No, you know what it does? It takes our money a different way. Instead of calling it taxes, you're calling it fees. But I'm still hearing only one sound, and that's the giant sucking sound of money being taken out of my pocket. This budget is... Pure and simple, another tax and spend budget. And in fact, one of the individuals who said it most clearly is Newt Gingrich himself. He said it in an interview. Let's call it for what it is. I want to quote this, what Newt Gingrich said. Quote, 
Republicans made the calculation that they want to get to the election with no more fuss, focus on Obamacare, and retake the Senate. So he produced a budget that raises spending and raises taxes. It's as simple as that, end of quote. You got it. It's as simple as that with Washington speak thrown in. With Paul Ryan trying to tell us that this is medicine we really should swallow, that actually in the long run it's good for the country. Listen to how his partner in this bill, uh, Senator Murphy, spun it. Roll it, Brittany. For far too long here in Washington, D.C., compromise has been considered a dirty word, especially when it comes to the federal budget. So I am very proud to stand here today with Chairman Ryan to announce we have broken through the partisanship and the gridlock and reached a a bipartisan budget compromise that will prevent a government shutdown in January. And how does it do that? This isn't compromise. It's another C word. It's called capitulation. So here, Paul Ryan is basically capitulating his principles. And I said it this summer. I said, listen, You want to stare reality in the face or you don't want to stare reality in the face. The Republican Party's core principles are to limit the role of government in our lives. But what's actually happening? Government keeps growing. Government keeps getting more intrusive. The Republican Party is committed to upholding family values. But what keeps happening? Family values are being flushed down the sewer faster and faster with every passing day. So on all the things that matter most, the Republican Party is not succeeding. And just look at the evidence. You have people that the Tea Party has elected. Somebody like Paul Ryan, he's been a darling until now. And now he simply turns on a dime on the very own principles that he touted. And what about Marco Rubio? He was the casualty just before him. Remember, Marco Rubio was being talked about before as a leading possible presidential candidate. He was the darling senator of Florida, another Tea Party candidate. And what happened to him? The power got to his head, and before you know it, he was trying to tell us that immigration reform is absolutely necessary and a bill that is horrible for the country should be passed. And Paul Ryan's doing the same thing. So what do we see happening? This Republican Party resembles the Democratic Party in a key way. It's like a vortex. You take a person with good intentions and good principles and you send them into these machines. And before you know it, they sound like the very people they were elected to replace. And we, the idiot conservatives, the idiot base, keeps thinking that the Republican Party will do something different for us. It won't. And what I'm saying is break it up. I know it sounds radical, but trust me, it's the only solution. We need to found the Christian Party of America and say this nation will only go on the right track if we put Christianity first. We are professed Christians taking that message to Washington, D.C. We're putting social issues first. And I assure you, when you put social issues first, believe it or not, the economic principles follow. I mean, think about this. What did our founding fathers do? Did they put economic principles first? They put social issues first. When they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, did they say, we're doing this because we want more money in our pocket? No. They said this republic is based on virtue and liberty. They put core values ahead of money. And we who have backed the Republican Party have allowed ourselves to be sucked in to the materialism and the secularism that is destroying the capital. And you're seeing it right before your eyes, a man that by all accounts is a good man. And I've got to say, I know Paul Ryan. One of my best friends knows him and his wife very, very well. 
So if they can do this to a good man, they can do it to everybody. The machine is rotten. The machine corrodes. And we've got to take a sledgehammer to the federal government and to the party that is feeding into this monstrous beast that just keeps growing. And, you know, talk about people losing their way when they get to Washington, D.C. I have liked Michelle Bachman. I truly have. I even thought she did a fairly good job when she was running for the uh, nomination of the Republican Party. I was saddened to see that her campaign imploded. But, you know, recently, even she has gone off the bend. A few nights ago, on the O'Reilly Factor... O'Reilly asked her, why is it that Republican poll numbers are so low? You'd think they should be soaring as the Republican Party should be capitalizing on the fiasco that is Obamacare. And you know what she said? Yes, we've got to rebrand the party and we've got to make the people understand something. Well, listen for yourself. Roll it, Brittany. Well, they absolutely plan. will. They no, absolutely will so. because Two because things. it's a positive message of helping people. Government right. can help people, not hurt people. There, Obamacare the, is hurting people. The and Democrats we're help are going to say, "Where?" Did you hear what I heard? She said that one of the things that the Republican Party has to do is send the message that government can help people. Michelle Bachman, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your marbles? Do you not know the first principle of being a Republican or a conservative is to understand that the government never helps, it only hurts? We want the government out of the way. That is what limited government is all about. And listen to her. She rattled on and on for the next 10 minutes about all the policies that perhaps the government should do to help people. And that's the way we're going to beat the Democrats. Roll it, Brittany. And you do that with opportunity zones. Create a parallel universe of growth. We always had it in America. We will again. That's the Republican positive message of helping people, not hurting. You know, she wants to help people with this and that policy, subsidies for subsidies for this education policy and for that education policy. And Michelle, Michelle, shut up. Shut up. Get the government off our backs. That's what the base wants you to do when you go to Washington, D.C. Don't expand it. Don't capitulate to the Democrats. Get the government out of the way. It's very simple. You're listening to Dr. Grace crying in the wilderness, upholding values that will never, ever die. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back to American Heartland. I'm your host, Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. And you know who believes in each other no matter what? It's President Obama and HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. What does it take to get fired in the Obama administration? Fire this woman for crying out loud. He keeps supporting her and she keeps supporting Obamacare. I mean, at what point do you guys just cut your losses? This week, it got farcical. We're beyond pathetic. We're beyond rage right now. We're straight into farcical. Because Kathleen Sebelius said in Congress, guess what? She is so concerned about this disastrous fallout that she's calling for an investigation. Yes, she's going to investigate herself. I like it. I like it. It's the new normal in America. Comedy is becoming the new normal. 
In testimony this week before Congress, Ms. Sebelius showed that she is, I mean, beyond the point of needing to be fired. Listen to what she says when she is asked about the enrollment numbers. Roll it, Brittany. Madam Secretary, based on uh, current trends, it's likely that more individuals will have lost coverage on January 1 than will have gained it under the law. HHS released data this morning stating that approximately 364,000 Americans have selected a plan through a state or federal exchange. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Of these 364,000 Americans, do you know how many of those individuals will actually have coverage in effect on January 1, 2014? Sir, once they pay their premium, they'll have coverage in effect. So you don't know. These are the ones who have just selected a plan but haven't paid their first payment on their premium. Some may have paid, some may not. We're giving you the enrollment numbers. Uh so they're now giving us the enrollment numbers, which are very low, and at this rate, we'll never make the $7 million that we need to make in order for this program to have any chance of success by March. And they're not telling us exactly how many people have paid, probably because they're not truly sure. I think that's what was evident here. We know from previous testimony they haven't finishing the back-end part of the website. So it is as clear as daylight that this program will fail. At this point, if I were advising the president and the HHS secretary, I would say, listen, guys, we need to cut our losses as soon as possible because this ship is sinking and it is sinking really, really fast. The president needs to show to the country that people who are clearly incompetent, people who have failed at their jobs, must be axed. You know, perhaps like private sector velocity. Remember they wrote that in defending the relaunch of the website, that now they're working at private sector velocity. How about private sector velocity when it comes to firing people? This woman in the private sector would have been gone yesterday. Yesterday is even too late. And, you know, it gets worse. In testimony, she was asked about the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent on a website that isn't working and isn't finished. And she's said clearly that she doesn't know where $300 million of that went. So not only do we not have the proper enrollees, not only was the website not working, not only was the website not finished, now there's massive misappropriation of funds at stake. In addition, the secretary kept being evasive and clearly incapable in addressing all the questions that Congress was asking her. Roll it, Brittany. Well, Mr. Waxman, what I find is um, a lot of people are <clears throat> eager for information. Uh, they are confused by what they read and hear. And uh, frankly, um, the uh, launch didn't help that. But as people understand their options and choices, um, I find that there is enormous enthusiasm, uh, often huge relief. Uh, a lot of individuals uh, who received the notice of uh, a cancellation uh, are unlocked from a policy choice that um, they did not feel was good for them or their families. They were kind of locked into a plan. And uh, I talk to people every day who now have 40 or 50 choices a range of marketplace plans, the option to pick and choose. Uh, that isn't to say that there aren't some individuals who would have preferred to stay in their plans, which is why I think the president um, decided on the transition policy uh, in the marketplace. But uh, a lot of individuals didn't know what they had offered cancellation to on, notices on the uh, are thrilled with the choices that are now available. Notice how she says a lot of these people are thrilled. I would have sat there and said, okay, name one. Okay, name two. 
It's very vague. It's very evasive. When you ask for the numbers by their own numbers, this whole thing is a disaster. And any explanation they give is clearly based on a fantasy that she is creating in her own mind. Now, this woman is heading out to Miami. This is her third visit in four months. They're trying to bolster the program there in Florida. And one of the things that's also been, I think, really underreported is that we had a soft launch over the weekend of the Spanish language version of healthcare.gov. That one, too, was supposed to be launched before. And remember, if the president doesn't get enough Hispanics to sign up, that's another huge problem. And all the numbers are now pointing to Hispanics not buying it. So, by all accounts, this woman should be fired. It is very disturbing that again and again, no matter what goes wrong with the federal government, the president of the United States doesn't seem to have the courage to let people go. A shakeup is usually a good thing in the midst of such a catastrophe. Get fresh people in there. But don't just add more people. You notice how the president just calls more people in but never actually fires anybody? You've got to ask yourself why that is. Because this country is beginning to resemble a third world nation where the federal bureaucracy is so big, it is so vast, even when it makes mistakes, there is no mechanism of correcting it. Nobody is held accountable. And just like a third world country, massive amounts of money suddenly disappear. And one of the things I explained this week on my uh, regular segment, uh, I'm interviewed by Carl Lamb every week. I explained that if you have a massive bureaucracy, no accountability, misappropriation of funds, this resembles a third world country. And our society is slipping in that direction. The president had the gall to lecture us on the inequalities that exist in America, the great gap between the very rich and the very, very poor. This country used to be well known for having a prosperous, thriving middle class. That is what makes us different than other nations, that we can have hundreds of, um, that we can have so many millions of people thriving in the middle class. And In other countries, mostly you have the very rich and the very poor and nothing in between. And yet, when you have a government that is extremely vast and intrusive and the free market can't work properly, increasingly, you crush the middle class and all that's left are the very rich and the very, very poor. You know, in the other segment, I said we need to take a sledgehammer to the Republican Party. And that's because we need an even bigger sledgehammer to the federal bureaucracy. This thing has got to be cut dramatically and cut swiftly. And we should have no ifs, buts, or qualms about doing it. America works best when people get out of the way of the creativity and ingenuity and talent and savvy and hard work of the American people. We don't need layers of bureaucracy. We don't need morons like Kathleen Sebelius telling us what to do or what not to do. And we certainly don't need a president like this man, President Obama, who can't hold anybody accountable. We need to return to the vision of the founding fathers, which is keep government small and out of the way so that all the creativity and ingenuity of the American people can burst forward and result in tremendous prosperity for the middle class and an economy that is the envy of the world. You're listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, and I am upholding values that will never, ever die. Well, if you ask me where I come from, Here's what I tell everyone I was born by God's dear grace 
The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. 